Greetings, this is Griff Ruby, the Nostalgic Catholic, with yet another uh, Touched by an Angel episode review. Now, this very next one here is called An Unexpected Snow. This episode is kind of a special place for me. Um, there's a handful of stories I've seen where it's like you're, you're taken out of your normal day-to-day -day whatever and really transported into this different it's like another world but a beautiful one of peace and calm and bright and and just there's no demands there's no pressure you just kind of sit here and you know whatever you'd like to do putter in a garden or whatever it's not like there's something you need to run off and do or anything you could just sit and do this or that and and it's peaceful it, it, it's really just taking a vacation out of the world as you know it. And I can think of three others in the world of programs that I can, that kind of give some of the same thing. And I've also had a, you know, once had a dream like that once. And, he, and even went to a place like that one time. But let's start with the other ones and then we'll get to this one. Um, so... Where would I see them? Well, one of them was the, um, hmm, was the Charlie Brown one, believe it or not, and probably one of the least popular ones. Because the name would just escaped me. But it's the one where Linus does an awful lot of roller skating and also going to these mysterious parties that, you know, except for one that's supposed to be his birthday party, these other parties, it's not even clear what they ever were. But then there's this about five minutes hard to believe it's only five minutes I had to time it where Linus has just been roller skating along just bibbity bobbing along being whatever uh, you better have a taste for roller skating if you can put up for most of this episode and then he hears some really nice singing voice and he stops and he passes through a gate and as soon as he gets through that it's like he has departed from the whole world of Peanuts and Charlie Brown and all the rest of it into this very calm place it's this beautifully tended garden and there in the midst of it all is this little girl named Mimi and she's just gonna yeah see now these these flowers here I like these these are pansies because they have nice little faces on them and you know, she's just going on and you know here can you help me put some of this fertilizer yeah sure you know, like, this is nowhere you need to go nothing you need to do just be there and enjoy the company of this little girl who sings this hauntingly beautiful little song out of some opera, I guess. I wish I knew what the word was. Apparently, it gets used in another uh, uh, Peanuts episode for something else, the same melody, but not the way it's sung. And it's, it's, it's really, even the voice is haunting as well as the song. It all adds up to something. And for five minutes, we're not in Peanuts. We're in some whole different world that just seems so peaceful. It's like, I'd like to be there. Okay, another one. Star Trek. Next Generation Movies. I believe the title was Insurrection. And we're on this planet on the earth in Baku. Live. And again, it's all very peaceful, these kids. Adults, whatever. The adults seem to live forever. Though for all the number of kids you see, I don't know why you would have a whole lot more adults around. But... Be all that as it may. Again, it's just, it's unhurried, it's unrushed, it's all very idyllic and beautiful, and people have time to make every little bit of, every bit of the detail, you know, really, really pretty and really nice. And just give all the things all the attention they need, and no one's rushed at anything. And again, it's not considered one of the better Star Trek movies. Most people think it's kind of stupid because. You know, this planet has this weird life-extending power, and you know uh, the Federation wants to get this thing from them by transporting these people to some other planet. Uh, but it was their planet, first of all, and second of all, you just got something far too... It's just criminal to try to destroy something that beautiful. Yeah, and so that was kind of another one. And then another one that comes to me, there's a Twilight Zone episode where the guys 
he's stuck in this traffic jam. He's afraid of losing you. He's this legal agent type guy who's got some sports here that he's the agent for. And he's afraid of losing you to some other agent. He's just trying to get him. Look, look, come on, don't leave me yet. I gotta get work with you on this, okay? Come on, guy, you're a great person. I want to help you feel and work with you on this. Just, just give me another chance, you know. And for some reason, and I don't remember the specifics, he has to stop his car and go off into these trees on the side of the thing, on the side of the road. And he goes through and suddenly he finds himself in this place where it's all nature and land. And there's this beautiful house up there just in the middle of nowhere. It, it doesn't have a driveway or a garage. You have to walk through woods up to this you know, totally, you know, very big, beautiful house, all equipped with anything you ever want. You wake up, there's always whatever you need to cook for breakfast and lunch, you know, whatever. It's all there. Just, you know, there's a girl there, who lady there who's kind of also come from who knows where. And they're just in this sort of a paradise until you know, some other person comes in and brings them a cell phone and he wants to call find out what's going on with his, uh, you know, client. And next thing you know, thunder and lightning and it's all over. But it still kind of has that same scene, although the atmosphere isn't strong. Now, I had a dream where, suppose you took a city with all these skyscrapers very high, you laid a blanket on top of the whole thing, and because of the different heights of the skyscraper, it's kind of topsy-turvy, the whole contour of the ground. But that whole contour is carefully used and exploited where the houses and little you know, stone pathways, you know, and every inch of the ground is planted with flowers and you know, what have you, these little little stone cottages here and there and you're always going up and down a hill from one to the other and it was just peaceful and you know, like that finally one other that was a great experience for me was going up to a uh, what we call mount saint michael which was a uh, it was originally made by the jesuits and is now controlled by a particular religious order traditional order and i think the best in my opinion i went up there in 1995 and this was a place where all of the Catholicism of the bygone days, which is actually the real Catholicism, and still exists there and a few other any place like it. You know, look for the Latin Mass if you want to find this sort of thing. But this was a whole place because it wasn't just a Mass. It was a school full of children, Catholic children in their little uniforms and everything. And still, like it's 1950s, I'm, a, I'm just some random adult. They don't even know who I am, nor does it matter. But as they go by, it's, a, you, know, you know, hello, sir. Hello, sir. <laughs> you know, and just so many little things in this place that, again, it was like, I didn't want to have to leave. I didn't want to have to go back to my regular life. But, unfortunately, I do. But, well, here we are, though. So, it's... At any rate, so now we're going to have something here. This lady that I've been showing at the beginning is one, one of our two main dramatic characters, in addition to Monica and Test, and we will have a bit of Adam, and, and another fellow who turns up a little later on. This is Megan. She's driving along this country road. And this is... Uh, I can't remember her name. So, but whatever it is, she's... Also, she's obviously some kind of lawyer, and she works along um, just on the phone to somebody or other. And the two cars practically, you know, not quite collide, but they're running, up, getting run off the road by each other. You can see Megan's car is over here, the little white one, and the lawyer the lady's car is over here, the little red one. And they're kind of, you can see, it's kind of the middle of nowhere, and kind of figuring out what to do. Well, it's not really the middle of nowhere. Well, there's no roof for Monica and or Tess to sit on, but there is a sort of a mountainside. So they're kind of standing here, looking down on all of this scenario, watching these two ladies kind of feud and fight. Okay. And then something really extraordinary happens. They come and introduce themselves. Well, there's, nobody comes out on this road much anymore. <clears throat> it could be, you know, hours or days before anybody else even comes along. So who knows? There's no phones here, and we don't have a phone. But if you'd like to stay the night, you know, we'll, we'll take care. We'll take you in for the night, and it'll be really nice. Where? Now, 
this is one of the most dramatic interventions so far we've seen, and I think it's actually in a way even more impressive than some of the ones we'll see later that also impress people. Now this is what happens. You get a little hint of what the place naturally looks like. We'll see another hint of that at the end from the other perspective. It's just some stretch of road in the mountain area, and that's all. Well, something else happens, something extraordinary. <laughs> So, just by the side of the road, this is a nondescript area, this whole dramatic place is just installed. Just <laughs> there's a gate, and there's a road, and there's trees. And as they go inside, they walk along this long brick driveway. And, uh, okay, Megan and Monica in the front. Tess taken up the rear and in between shuttling back and forth is the lawyer lady still trying to get a signal on her phone. <laughs> that one should have been worth catching the movement, but that's okay. And they finally come up to this very lovely old style house. Again, it's just really pretty. Yeah. And uh, you get inside. This is the room Megan gets. It's not all that big or fancy, but it's small. It's amply furnished. I like the way that one wall is at an angle. That's kind of cool. Okay. And another view on here. There's you know, The mountains are still around. But here's this place. you got a duck, I don't know, a swan or something. A black swan. Okay. you got, uh, well, I think that's... Maybe that's Megan walking around on the shore across the way. A little gazebo there. You know, just really pretty. Adam pays a visit for a while, plays the piano. They have a nice little joke where Tess says, well, Hey, Adam, where'd you learn to play the piano? And he says, just funerals. <laughs> Angel of Death, learn to play the piano at funerals. Uh, uh, that's a good place to learn, isn't it? Okay. And meanwhile, a lawyer has <clears throat> her room. Now, there's one other thing in each of these pictures that barely shows. The book that she has on there has a picture of a guy. It's like a picture book of, I don't know, whatever. And um, inside her room, she has set up a little picture of a guy. Now, they're the same guy. They're the same guy. So, let's see, what do we do here? They're the same guy, and we'll get back to that. Meanwhile, Adam has showed up, and Tess has a job for him to do. See that tech? Alexander? What did I tell you? Don't go getting stuff. It's Thanksgiving, and Adam, the angel of death, has a little job to do with the turkey. He's going to go to this reward <laughs> and be the <at> dinner. <laughs> so, anyway, here's another picture again. Here's some swans, there's the stone, whatever it is, the grass. And she's just all this, you know, this nice sweater she finds in the closet there to put on. And here's another view of this house yet from another standpoint. There's a little bridge that crosses this brook. And, oh gosh, I mean, it's just pretty. Well, you know, again, this place probably captures that whole peaceful place. It's just, they have their busy, angst-filled lives, and then suddenly they're inside a place where all that just doesn't exist. Well, <clears throat> along comes trouble in the form of this gentleman who happens to be married to the lawyer and going with the uh, other girl, Megan, the nature girl, she gets called. Well, 
The lawyer's glad to see her husband. The husband's glad she's okay. She'd been terribly worried about it, but uh, uh, there was a marriage, some kind of scheme had sort of gone out of. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, she sees all this, and she's just shocked and horrified. The guy who is going with this woman, that she's had a good chance to actually get to know, and relax around, become friends with, and then suddenly, you know, she, you know, Terrible realization. Because um, you see, that husband was less than straight. He, he said to her, well, he's got this, he's married to this ice queen and said, I'm happy, married, blah, blah, blah. You're my only real source of happiness, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, now she's gotten to know the wife in a context where they didn't understand that they were both involved with the same guy and, and become friends with her. Now all of a sudden, so, uh, well, I like the way she describes the situation. I swear to this I swear, I didn't know who she was till you walked through the door. Why don't you tell me Sonny's name is Susanna? What are we doing on this road anyway? I told you to take the interstate. I don't know. Look, I'm sorry. Are you okay? You told me she was a nice queen. She's sweet. She's wonderful. You don't give her enough credit. Look, this is crazy. I'm not going to talk about this. I just thought you were miserable with her. I thought I was the one who was supposed to make you happy. You do. You are. Let's just get through this. And, and what? And I'll work something out. You've been saying that for a year. I know. It's just taking longer than I thought. Maybe there's a reason for that. And what's that supposed to mean? I always knew you had a wife. I just never realized you were married. <laughs> I love that line. I always knew you had a wife. I never realized you were married. <laughs> That's a great line. I love that line. So, <laughs> it's a lot of tension. They're kind of trying to be discreet about it. And, <clears throat> and at least it seems like the lawyer lady's kind of being oblivious to all of this undercurrent going on. So they're having this kind of pleasant evening after dinner or whatever. Adam's back on the piano and uh, Tess decides to sing a song, you know, and she does some singing in these early. She's already done that, um, um, The Lord Moves in Mysterious Ways back a few episodes ago. Now she does another one here. There's Adam with the piano, Tess is singing, and her song's really meant for Megan, not so much for the other. The lawyer lady goes up with her husband upstairs to have them. <clears throat> Just the two of them. So. It's special. Then we get the snow. Tonight when he looked at me and walked up the stairs with her, I realized, my God, I'm just the other woman. I'm his secret. He's been keeping me in a room I didn't even know I was in. Yes, so... Oh, yeah, I should have horrible realize I'm just the other woman. <laughs> you know, it's funny how first if you do these kinds of things, you just not think through what they've been doing. Oh, now comes the big sudden snow. This is our revelation. Uh-oh. What's God going to say? She blows. But he can't wipe away your tears unless you let him. The road I took yesterday, it wasn't an accident. This place, this house was created for you. For this night, this moment. Megan, I'm an angel. And this is your unexpected snow. Uh, hmm. Although unexpected snow also means one moment it's all normal sunshiny, the next the snow hits you. You know, the discovery of what she's, you know, the involvement with this guy that she, she's had all this time. Meanwhile, Tess is having a little bit of a revelatory moment too with uh, the gentleman. Who's at this recreation of some cabin he used to be at when he was younger and 
once sat on this exact little hanging bench with her, his wife, wife, or maybe still a wife to be at the time. And Tess is kind of bringing her back to that, bringing him back to that moment to uh, help him remember that. <sighs> well, they kind of learned to reconcile it. And, and so the, the couple have their togetherness. And she has this little token, a little snow, <laughs> snow thing, you know. When these little toys, you shake it and the snow goes all over the place. And so, to kind of remind her of this time, she'll take this with her. So, this, this is kind of nice, because even though it was really nice and wonderful, when it's time for it all to be over, you know, you need to go back to your regular life now. But at least there's something not just nice or even a memory, but something actually useful, you know. The, the, the lawyer, well, they're walking out together here. And the lawyer holds her aside and says, you know, I could tell that you, you were the other woman. As soon as I heard about the name, I wondered. That's when I knew you were the person. You know, can you forgive me? I'm sorry I hadn't known this, blah, blah, blah. Well, I think I'll be able to forgive you. So, <clears throat> presumably she will. So, so presumably she will... Um, Forgive uh, Megan, and so they're friends, you know. And uh, Megan kind of has some promise that someday she will have somebody that's for her. So they all kind of, you know, and, and that little souvenir, the little like a token or reminder that, like a little promise of that. So they come out. It's all done, and now it's time for the place to fall apart again. And it's kind of in reverse how it all goes. So, and there we have it. The whole place just disappears. Like Brigadoon or something. I love those kinds of peaceful things. Now you have the story itself. It's also pretty good. I mean, I think it's kind of neat. You meet the two ladies, they meet each other, and they kind of get, um, you know, they get used to each other, they become friends, and then the guy shows up and turns out to be the husband of the one and the you know, illicit boyfriend of the other. And that's, you know, that, the whole thing's kind of handled with a lot of taste and tact and yeah, that's a pretty dramatic uh, invention, making that whole great big house. Obviously, they had to have filmed that someplace, probably in Europe. I don't know where else you'd find a place like that. This old historical old house that just, you just look at it and it's like you're in a whole nother time, a whole nother place. And it's just the perfect place for just, you just relax with somebody, you get to know them, they get to know you, and you don't, there's no pressure on you. It's just the one thing, and I don't know. So that episode really stands out in my mind. I really, it's one of the things that really gives me real love for this series. Is episodes like that that just give me a real vacation from the world as we know it. I've gone way over. I've overstayed my years. Thanks for listening.